Welcome to the International Franchise Association's Women's Franchise Committee podcast, Her Success, the Story of Female Franchise Leaders. I'm Michelle Rowan, President of Franchise Business Review, and today I'm talking with Susan Blackbeck. She's the founder and managing partner of Team Up Leadership, a coaching and advisory business focused on accelerating growth and transformation of organizations and individuals. And prior to launching Team Up, Susan was the chief operating officer of NRD Capital and grew up in the Superwash franchise system her parents founded and was also a Superwash franchisee and then was also a a public speaker. And she's also a former chair of the WFC and has won the Crystal Compass Award and the Bonnie Levine Award. And she started the second chapter of our women's franchise networking groups in Chicago with Barb Moran. Wow. So in theater, and entertainment, they have the EGOT for people who've won the Emmy, the Grammy, the Oscar, and the Tony. We need to come up with a franchising equivalent because you've honestly been on every side of the business. <laughs> yeah, it's been a great year, 20 year run. Yeah. PE, you plan an event with Franchise Capital Exchange. You've been a speaker. Yep, you've got it all. Okay. So I first saw you speak before I met you or knew you. I was trying to think who introduced us and I don't know. I don't don't remember a time before Michelle Rowan. My life. Well, I remember I remember a time before Susan Beth, but I don't know what the first time meeting you, but I remember speaking, seeing you speak. And it was when you were doing your passion bucket, which I love. So I want to ask you a little bit about that. But I don't remember how who introduced us. Thank goodness they did. But I, what I remember is connecting with you because we're around the same age. We both, I think everyone talks about like being a mom and juggling work, but what I picked up from you is that you love your career, you love your family. And so we've kind of, I think I've felt supported by you, but just kind of like, how do you juggle all of that? And how do you, how do you be where you need to be? And and it's hard, it's hard. So I appreciate just kind of going through it with you. So I want to say that. Yeah, me too. Um, but yeah, so there's so much that I want to talk with you about. So do you want to give us kind of a, how you worked through franchising because you started so young and you were literally born into a franchise system, just kind of that journey through all the different pieces and, and, and perspectives you have on franchising? Yeah, absolutely. So my parents are the founders of the nation's largest self-serve car wash chain, and that's Super Wash Car Washes. And my mom was three months pregnant with me putting the roof on the very first car wash they ever built. So literally, I've been working my whole life. I didn't start getting paid for it until I was four, though. Um, So when I say, when did I start working? I literally mean four years old. My parents had the car wash in our hometown, and my sister is six years older than I am. So I would tag along with her. And for many years, she and I ran that car wash together. I can feel her eyes blurring into the back of my head right now because she'll be like, no, I did all the work and you were just a pain in the butt. And so that's probably also very true. Do you Um, remember what your first wage was? Do you remember what your hourly rate was? Yes, 25 cents an hour. (laughs) And um, it was the early 80s and 25 cents an hour for hanging up vacuum hoses. That was my very first job. Um, For many years, my dad told a story about... um, my very first customer service interactions where I was dealing with customers that were being rude to a little kid. And, you know, he just told me to wipe my tears and go back out and meet and greet the next person. Right. And so I think that's probably really deeply ingrained in me. Um, But I grew up working in the family business. Um, When I was 19 and a sophomore in college, um, my sister and I bought our first superwash together. My parents have an unwritten rule, a couple of them. And one of them was if you were going to sit on their executive committee, you had to have active ownership interest in at least one superwash. So while I didn't know that that was ultimately where I was going to end up for a period of time, we did get into business ownership very early. So I bought my first superwash when I was 19, along with my sister. Then we built a store from the ground up when I was 23. We bought a third location along the way. So I spent about eight and a half years probably as a multi-unit franchisee. Another unwritten rule that um, my mom and dad had was we had to go work somewhere else before we could come back to work in the family business. They wanted us to see what it was like elsewhere. And so I graduated from college and moved to the big city, which is Chicago for me, and um, got my first job out of college, which was great. And then my dad said, look, I'm, I'm finally considering wanting to convert the superwash business model from licensing to franchising. And I want you, I want you to come back. I want you to do this with me. And I said, dad, I don't know anything about franchising. 
And he said, well, get together with Lou Rudnick. And many of the old timers will remember Lou as a wonderful, uh, just a wonderful man and friend and mentor to many. Um, he was a lawyer and he was also of service to the IFA for many years. And I had lunch with Lou and he said, Susan, you can do this. The first thing you need to do is get involved with the IFA and go to convention and get your CFE. And that is exactly what I did. And my involvement with the Women's Franchise Committee and the WFN and all of that flowed from that time in my life. So it's literally been 20 years um, and I was, you know, 23 at the time. And so a lot of the friends and folks that I know who may be listening to this podcast, like they've grown up with me, literally. Um, they saw me get married and have my two boys and my boys are now 13 and 15. Um, and I was in the family business, uh, ultimately as the chief operating officer until December 17th of 2014. Um, a very important day because I say my husband and I were both crying at the end of that day, him because he was turning 40 and me because I had finally left the family business um, after 37 and a half years. So um, that twist was that I was leaving the family business to go help my friend from the IFA, Aziz Hashim, who's the founder and managing partner of NRD Capital. I was leaving the family business to go stretch my entrepreneurial wings again um, and help him start his private equity fund. So <laughs> those are kind of some of the big pinnacles along the way. I launched my professional speaking career in 2010 at the very strong encouragement and direction of Fred DeLuca, the founder of Subway, who mentored me through my entire startup of my speaking business and truly backed me. My very first professional speaking gig was at the Subway Worldwide Convention. I was the only outside speaker that they brought into that convention and he very much put his money, if you will, where his mouth was. And then I founded the Franchise Capital Exchange in 2012 and ultimately went on to reinvent myself in the world of private equity and restaurants and become an investor. Love it. So I have lots of questions just based on that. So now your experience working in the business with your family and out, same, would you give the same advice to someone that is in the same position that your parents kind of guided you with? Do you think that it's important for an executive team member to have some skin in the game? Does it make them a better leader? And do you think that uh, if you're in a family business that there is a value in kind of getting out and seeing something else before you go back into it? Second question first, absolutely. Right, absolutely. Um, the business that I went into when I graduated from college, right, there was an attendance lady. And we had to be in our seat uh, on Wacker Drive in downtown Chicago by 8 a.m. And if you weren't there for attendance, you were marked as having taken a personal day, right? And I didn't like, I didn't even know that that was a possibility, let alone existed in the world. Um, now you could leave at 8.05 for three hours and go get coffee, um, but you had to be there at eight. So there were all sorts of things like that, how to work the politics, how to you know really have a boss that wasn't also your dad or your mom. Um, all those things are super important. Um, and as far as having skin in the game, I don't know that it has to be monetary skin. Um, I think that is incredibly powerful and I'll tell you why. So the, my parents' reasoning would be my same reasoning. I very much agree with it. They wanted us to really understand what it felt like as a licensee and then as a franchisee to have the struggles of being a business owner, right? So we're receiving these phone calls from, let me just use franchisees kind of post 2000 for ease of conversation, right? And the franchisee would call in and say, Susan, oh my gosh, it's been raining for three months which is horrible in the car wash business. Who do I pay first? What do I do? And they wanted us to have a level of empathy and understanding about how horrible that feeling is instead of saying, well, I don't know, it'll stop raining eventually, but don't forget your royalty fees are due on the 15th of the month. And so I think as, as organizations can figure out ways to have at least their the top tier leader, uh, leaders have that empathy, it's really important. Yeah, I think more so. I think people are more tuned into that now post COVID, just that emotional intelligence in all your leaders that I can't imagine someone taking attendance at the beginning of a day of, of, of anywhere now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that was, of course, 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> I love it. So the, one of the themes in your life that I love and I want to ask more about is change because I think that is one of the hardest things for people that are successful, 
they're content where they are to mitigate the risk or the decision to make the change. So in your story that you started with, I picked up on, you had, a, I would say hype men, you had a lot of cheerleaders around you that kind of pushed you towards that decision. Did you seek them out? Is there something about you that just attracted them wanting to kind of urge you to try something new? Or how do you, how did you get through that decision-making process to know, like, I'm leaving what I know, I'm leaving what's comfortable, I'm leaving a great salary to go to the unknown. How did you personally work through that? And why do you think you got so much support from the people around you? Yeah, I think I'm one of those folks who I get uncomfortable when things stay the same too long. And my franchisees at Superwash would tell you that they're like, well, anytime Susan gets involved, something's going to happen, right? We don't know if it's going to be good or bad always, but something's going to happen. And that's very true. Um, and I always want to be growing and learning and challenging myself. And so the decision to leave the family business was by far the hardest one, by far, um, because those are people you love, right? We can have colleagues who we love, but these are people you love. And so that one was the hardest. That was about three and a half years that I really struggled. And it wasn't until this like piece of the puzzle clicked in place during a conversation with Aziz that I was like, okay, that's it. So I had struggled for like three and a half years and the decision to leave and take a risk with Aziz was made in four days. Mm -hmm. And part of that decision process was I didn't want to be 50 looking back still in the family business going, gee, I wish I would have. Right. And so I have that kind of, if you'll call it fear of missing out or, or whatnot. I also have this huge, and I really want to talk openly about this. Um, I had really crazy imposter syndrome and my whole thing was, okay, I want to, I think I want to leave. I think I want to challenge myself. I want to prove to myself that I'm as good as people think I am, right? Because in my head, I had been very blessed to have um, won the Crystal Compass and be recognized with the Bonnie Levine Award and, and other recognitions. But in my mind, I had only earned them because I was in the safety of a family business. And what was gonna happen if I went out into the world and nobody wanted me? Like, what if, what if people found out that I actually wasn't as good as they thought I was? And that really was a mind game for me. It continues to be at times. Like I have flashes of it still I'm in my mid forties at this point, right? Um, and so that was a real struggle for me. But I think change is really important. And when I was 15, I had access to an entrepreneur who had founded a business. And she said, if I'm still there as the CEO seven years after I founded the business, I have failed. Because I'm the, I'm the entrepreneur, I'm supposed to be starting setting and then moving on and doing the next thing while a team comes in. And that's always just kind of stuck with me. It's sort of been seven year increments. It looks like as I go back on my life, but I never wanted to be 40, 50, 60, looking back going, gee, I wish I would have, because then I knew I would have really let myself in my family down. I love it. Yeah. You've said that to me before. And so I'm, I'm now at 16 years at FBR, not always in this position, but I still love what I do and I feel like there's enough change there, but I do have that in the back of my mind that you've said that, that, but I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm a number two, but I really like that kind of check and balance that I always do. Like, am I still excited to get up and go in and do what I'm doing every day? And I think that's important for people. And I think that came out of COVID a lot for people as far as what changes do I need to make for my life or to what is going to be happy. And, and I want to say that to lead into you had a pretty stressful catalyst during COVID that kind of led to the changes that you're currently making in your life. And so um, I just, I don't know how much you want to talk about it, but I would love to just talk about, you were very public in sharing your journey. And I think what I loved is seeing the people that rallied around you on social to just, to really try and support you through it. But you had the absolute worst nightmare happen that any parent can imagine. So if you want to go into that, and how it's kind of led to, to your new venture that you're working on now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, and I'll go back to your previous question. I am incredibly blessed to have hype men, hype women, hype people in my life at every turn. And that's something I really work to foster, right? I want to surround myself with people. I When I was looking at starting uh, Team Up, 
I called folks that I called my challenge network. People who I trust love me enough to be like, you are being a total dumbass. Like, why would you do this? <laughs> this is not a good call, right? Who I know care enough about me and my success um, and my ability, hopefully, to impact others that they would tell me to stop if it was a really bad idea. And I'm so grateful for all of the different kinds of love. And it really showed through in the last 10 months of my life, um, both my personal life, my professional life, my finance friends, my baseball mom friends, my school mom friends, and all of them played huge roles. So I really thought the worst thing that was going to happen to me in 2020 is that I was a member of a five-person board. I was one member, the only female, not that that matters, but it's of note, um, to shepherd my first operating company through bankruptcy. And that was incredibly hard and very stressful. When I put my operator hat on, right, bankruptcy is failure. And so that's very different, thought of very differently in the investment world. But that was really stressful and very hard because we had worked our butts off. But it wasn't the worst thing that could happen. <laughs> the worst thing that happened is my 12-year-old son had a heart attack um, completely out of the blue on November 21st at about 11 o'clock in the morning. And I didn't know that what had happened is he had had a heart attack until 36 hours later when he was having emergency open heart surgery. Um, and, you know, he had been sick on Friday night, um, throwing up and whatnot. I apparently made the very grave mistake of drinking a beer called What Could Possibly Go Wrong? Um, and the world showed me, the universe showed me what could possibly go wrong. And so um, B has led us on quite a journey. He is okay. Let me go to the end of the joke, which is he is back at school and he is doing well. And um, we just keep our fingers and toes crossed that that's the path that he continues on. But uh, November was the heart attack and the first open heart surgery. They found a massive clot the size of a walnut had grown in his ascending aorta and was held in place by a thread, as the surgeons referred to it. Um, nobody that worked on my son in November can tell you why he's still here. And so um, I got to see many, many real life miracles happen right in front of me. Um, he spent 30 days in the hospital. We got home just before Christmas. He was in severe heart failure. Um, so we used lots and lots of medicines to try and help his heart repair itself. Um, and then we got to early March and we had several incidents, one in particular that was quite scary, um, that was showing that his heart probably wasn't healing. So we went in for an MRI in, on March 15th, and we found out that the entire bottom half of his left side of his heart was completely decimated by the heart attack and that it wasn't going to come back to work. And so he could either live his whole life with this very, very diminished capacity, which would continue to diminish um, of his heart, or he could have a heart transplant. And his, a heart transplant was really the only option at 12 um, on how you want to live your life. So we had to switch hospitals, which was challenging. Um, and we moved to one of the top children's hospitals in the country, which is Lurie Children's in Chicago, and started the process of Brandon getting listed for a transplant, thinking that we could have been there for months and months. And again, somehow the universe worked in our, in our beautiful favor and a donor family um, agreed to donate the gift of, of life to our son. Um, and he got his heart on April 14th. <laughs> so 10 days later, and it's just another miracle, I guess. <laughs> so he's, he did great. And we got released on April 29th. Believe it or not, you can have your chest cracked open <laughs> for the second time, get a heart transplant and leave the hospital two weeks later. And it's like when they send us home with babies and they're like, okay, you can go. And I was like, what? We can go? <laughs> like you just got a new heart. Um, but he did great until five days later, we went in for a regular checkup and they found that a new clot had grown um, in his new heart. And so that was probably the lowest point of the whole journey. He went immediately back into the hospital. And when I talk about being really good at measuring risk reward, um, I think I always have been, but my skills are pretty finely tuned now because our, our trade-off on that Tuesday, May 4th was we can leave the clot in place um, and it was, again, it was pretty big and it had grown in five days. Um, we could leave the clot in place and let his blood thinners kind of burn off over the course of the next three days. But every time his heart beats, we risk that clot breaking loose and going to his brain and killing him or giving him a stroke and completely incapacitating him for the rest of his life. Um, or we can go in right now and we can get the clot and we risk him bleeding out on the table. Um, so he was 20 some days post-transplant and apparently that is like the worst window of time to open somebody back up. 
um, from a bleeding perspective. And so that was risk reward at the time while our 12 year old is laying there. And ultimately we decided to wait three days and he went in and had his third open heart surgery and, and, and is doing amazingly well. The heart is very, very happy and we are incredibly grateful for the gift of, of organ. Yeah, it's, it was amazing to watch, first of all, how open and vulnerable you were with this journey um, and watching the decisions that you had to make as a mother were, I mean, it was heartbreaking to, to watch you go through it. Um, but I, I mean, obviously so thrilled everyone is healthy right now. I, know. Um, I mean, especially with, there's so many other risks out, out there um, that, you know, we just want to keep our children safe. But so in our conversations through this, you realized your your past role pre COVID had you on the road a lot, a lot, and you yeah. had decided that that was not something that you wanted to do. Uh, so you wanted to be there for your family. Yeah. So how, how long is that process, or how are you working through that? What, where, where you want to spend your time, and how you want to spend your next seven years? My next seven. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I was on the road pretty much every week leading up to COVID, and. I'll tell you one of the most, there were several like whew, moments through Brandon's um, situation, but one of them was when somebody mentioned COVID and Brandon said, I'm incredibly grateful to COVID. If not because of COVID, my mom was here. And that's really hard to hear, right? And I had a dad who traveled a lot when I was younger and trying to get the family business off the ground. And he pulled off the road when, when I was, um, probably 10-ish, maybe earlier. Um, and I, I just realized that moment that I know we all have and we all know, like they grow up and they move on and we put them out into the world. And I was like, literally my whole life could have changed, honest to God, in a heartbeat. One heartbeat, my whole life could have changed. And I was like, I wanna be here for it, right? My son's a sophomore, Brandon's in eighth grade. I got five years left with these guys at home. And the problems, as I understand it, for my friends who have been through it, they get bigger and they get harder as the kids get older. And I want to be here. I want to be the one that opens the door at the end of the day for them and not be in Atlanta or Dallas or New York City or wherever else I was at um, with such frequency. And so I pulled an Oprah and I designed my life kind of deal. And I was like, look, at the end of the day, here's how I want the next five to seven years to go. But I will tell you something, Michelle, that's really critical to me. And I, and I would like for this to be hopefully noted as part of my story, whenever it ends, is that every time I've made a change, there's always been a catalyst for it. But one of the catalysts for where I choose to go is that I always want to make a bigger impact on more people, right? When I started uh, you know, my own business, it was me, my sister and five or six employees. Right? And then I went back to Superwash Corporate and it was for 500 employees, you know? And then I went to um, NRD and that was literally several thousand because we had a lot of company owned stores in some of our portfolio and I was a board member and had direct influence over leaders and so on and so forth. And now I go, oh my gosh, right? I really wanna help the underrepresented voices be heard. I want to be a part of systemic change, especially in a post-COVID time where so many of us have been slapped in the face with what's really important to us. And so that's been, you know, it's been months and pockets of time and watching my kid lay there on a ventilator going, he's going to have other setbacks and I don't want to have to miss those. I want to be here. I want to be his mom. I want to be Andrew's mom. And that's been hard because I got to tell you, like, as much as I would love to say, you know, a number or a salary or the prestige of a title, and certainly the world of private equity is kind of held in high regard, like, I wish I could tell you that that didn't mean anything to me, but I'm not quite that deep. Like, I'm pretty superficial on some of this stuff. So it matters. <laughs> it matters. And I want to be a woman in business who make people proud and um, who that they, you know, can call on when they have something that they're up against. And so leaving the title and all of that behind is, is hard for my ego, but I know in my heart that I'm working towards the right outcomes where I believe I can use 40 years of experience to make a bigger impact on more people. Love it. Well, and you're also really fun. So not even just being there with your family for the setbacks, but to celebrate the stuff too. But I love Hopefully. one of the things when you came out to visit, you you take your family and you guys go visit 
baseball fields, right? We do. Yeah. Stadiums, yeah we, they're called. I'm not a sports ball person, as you yeah, can tell. <laughs> we drug you along and tried to get you some learnings. Um, but yeah, we love to visit the professional baseball stadiums. We're really huge sports fans. Both my boys played ice hockey um, and play baseball. I'm hoping that they start to become volleyball players because I was a volleyball player. And that was a volleyball a player too. Right. <laughs> Such a big part of our lives. And um, yeah, we try and do, you know, a couple trips a year. We try and do domestic um, and then we try and go international. And I will tell you one of the greatest gifts that NRD Capital gave me, I mean, there were many, um, but was the opportunity to take my family to South Africa. And that is something that I would, I will, I will hold on to that forever. And in Brandon's hospital rooms, we had a picture, we had several pictures from Africa, but one that he took of this really cool picture of a zebra. And I think it just kept like, kept all of us going that we just we just want to get back where we can do those things you want to feel good you want to feel healthy and a very dear friend of mine rose says your health is your wealth and that has never been more apparent to me than in the last 10 months yeah to both of you to rose too my goodness yeah for sure yeah well um so i i always kind of ask at the very end um to oh, think no, about are we the end <laughs> Um, I always like to ask, uh, what advice would you give to your 20 year old self or oh, to a, a woman geez. in franchising? The whole point of this, I think is to just make us all much more connected and accessible and, and to help people understand that it's not a direct path from where you start to where you go. Um, and that, you know, I think that you came into franchising in a different way that you were, I mean, you were kind of born into it as far as people embraced you. But I think what I hear is sometimes people don't know that the WFC is there. They don't know how to connect with other women in franchising. So thinking about that, if you're a young person that's in franchising on the supplier side, the franchisee franchisor side, what advice would you give to them or to yourself at 20 and at the beginning of your career? We'll see if my middle forties memory can hold on to all the pieces that just ran through my head, but I'll give the piece of advice that I used to give when I would speak at the convention for first timers, which is franchising is all about relationships. And I often, every time, so like seven years in a row, when I gave this speech, I said the same thing. Franchising is all about relationships. And if you don't believe that, don't bother getting to know me or my friends because you're not going to be here for long, right? Um, I some really, tough love. That's tough some tough love. love. It's like, true. I really believe that. It is all about relationships. It's why we are all sick after convention because we're <laughs> hugging and we're, you know, cheek kissing and we're hanging out together because we're fun relationship people. That's why it's so awesome to be here. Many people in franchising will tell you that their best friends are people they met in franchising, right? And I know that's certainly true for me. So I would say be very focused on relationships. If it's not your natural inclination, really try to be mindful about building those relationships and, and not always doing it with a very specific business purpose, right? Sometimes that's it's just great to, advice. to know somebody. It's just to, you know, it's just to have somebody new in your life and a different perspective. So I would definitely say that. I would say always just say hi. Just say hi. Like it, you never know. I mean, I just said hi to Fred DeLuca and he had a major impact on my life, right? Um, and that was amazing. Um, I would say, give yourself some grace. Like it, it feels like we're all supposed to be so hard charging and we're supposed to like, just keep achieving, keep achieving, keep achieving and just give yourself some grace. It's okay. It's okay to feel less than, but don't let that linger. Feel less than and then get back to living your life like just you're not less than right and um, I think those are probably some of the key things that I would say to my 20 year old self um, in addition to continue to surround yourself with people who will challenge you to be the very best version of you I love it and I think that's good advice too as you get older I think it's harder to give ourselves grace too I think when you're Agreed. when you're younger you think you know it all <laughs> when you're in your we did it. you realize we did it yeah. know it all you realize how oh. silly you were. Oh, silly, silly young me. Right. I think about yeah. Lori Rennick, who many folks um, may not have had the great pleasure of knowing. Lori was one of the first people I met in franchising, and she gave me a chance um, to talk on my very first panel at the IFA. And I said, yes. I was like, she gave me this opportunity. I am saying yes. And it was like transfers and succession planning was my first speech when I was like 23 or 24 years old. And I'm like, oh my God, was there a less sexy topic to be nope. given by, by nope. a car wash gal? Like, oh my God, I can't believe anybody <laughs> showed up. They showed up for Lori for sure. 
Oh, well, I, I appreciate getting to chat with you on film now. Now we're, now it's going to be here forever, but you always have such great advice perspective for people. Um, so tell us with your new role, um, you're going to be working both in franchising and outside of franchising, some of those financial relationships that you made as well. Yeah, definitely. So hopefully it's franchise companies that are pr typically private equity backed. So, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the businesses in the last sort of seven years, there's that number seven again, right, have um, been acquired by private equity groups. And I certainly understand all of those relationships. I've lived them very directly. I'm also really excited to have the opportunity to work with um, private equity firms and private credit firms, um, because there's just, all of us don't have all of the skills and the financial folks tend to be amazing financial folks, but the people piece is getting even more um, difficult and crucial. Um, again, coming in a post-COVID time where all of us have had an opportunity to kind of reassess what's really important to us. And um, I was just talking last night with a girlfriend who um, works for a very large international corporation. And she said, I, I, was, I was gone all the time. I was in Singapore. I was in Spain. I was all, all over. And she's like, I realized like, I, I can do this from here and I can be home for the band concert. Right. Um, and so just prioritizing those things now and being willing to set the boundaries um, to say, no, that's really important to me. Um, is hopefully what I'm going to help more folks feel comfortable doing. Awesome. Well, and I think it is, it's more acceptable to ask. I think none of us would have thought to ask to be Never. where we needed to be. So no. I Never. think that's great. Yep, awesome. Always a pleasure, Susan. Oh, Thank you so much. I cannot wait to see you in person, but this, this gave me a fix until then. Gave me a fix as well. And remember, it's called a baseball stadium. Baseball stadium. Right. Baseball stadium. Learning something new every day. Thanks, Susan. And I love that my kids love your kids. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Bye.